Hello, everyone. Uh, today, we are very honored to have Professor Sang Ping Xie as our speaker. Uh, Professor Xie uh, got his PhD from Tohaku University in Japan in 1991. Professor Xie has been a professor of University of Hawaii for many years before moving to University of California, San Diego in 2012 as a professor on climate dynamics. Uh, he is one of the most uh, highly cited researchers on climate dynamics and has been known for his research on the ocean atmosphere interactions uh, and the, the impact uh, on the climate variability. Professor Xie is a fellow of AGU and a fellow of AMS, uh, and uh, he received this full job gold medal in 2017, which is one of the most prestigious awards for oceanographer. Uh, today, his talk is about the predictive ocean dynamics in warming climate. So Professor Xie, thank you very much. Uh, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, uh, James, uh, for uh, the kind introduction and for the invitation to speak at this uh, very distinguished uh, department. Uh, so the title of my talk, I, I kind of uh, uh, give uh, this talk uh, as the uh, Ocean Sciences Lecture at the Asian Oceania Geophysical uh, Society. Uh, a few months ago, but I, I emphasize the predictive uh, uh, part of my my talk, and you will I guess that the what I meant with uh, predictive will become uh, clear as uh, as uh, we we are going through uh, the slides. So uh, I guess uh, my my talk here is uh, like a list of uh, the topics I would like to cover. So. First, uh, just a very kind of brief introduction uh, to oceans role in greenhouse warming. And then we're going to kind of discuss what drives ocean circulation change. And there, there may be some surprises uh, in, in there. And, and I, I'm going to also briefly discuss how does uh, you know, the ocean circulation change uh, affect climate change? In, in other words, the atmospheric changes in particular, in terms of uh, uh, tropical rainfall change. And uh, I will conclude with a very brief uh, outlook uh, based on the, the talk I, I'm going to present. Okay. Uh, uh, so here I'm showing a, a time series of global mean surface temperature, uh, averaged uh, every decade. Uh, as a 30 year climatology. So uh, you can see uh, like global mean surface temperature has been increasing uh, rather steadily uh, over the past 100 years, especially uh, after some sometime like 1970. Uh, we, you, you hear like uh, every year at the beginning or maybe in January, you know, the weather, you know, NOAA and several other uh, agencies that produce uh, uh, surface temperature records with a, with a proclaim uh, new records are being set or the past seven years are the warmest on the, on the record and so on. So I guess uh, uh, in terms of uh, understanding uh, the global, me global, mean, global mean surface temperature change, we, we, are, we usually uh, use the so-called ocean mixed layer heat budget. So namely uh, the top, uh, roughly top 100 meter ocean water uh, heat budget. So it can be uh, represented roughly uh, in this uh, schematic. In other words, uh, when we increase the uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we basically introduce the downward uh, uh, radiant flux uh, at the top of atmosphere. And then the, the ocean and uh, the land surface or atmospheres are going to warm up and the atmospheric warming is going to uh, radiate uh, mostly infrared, infrared radiation back into space. And the, another part of the so-called top atmosphere radiated forcing is being taken up by the ocean and stored be, be, below the warm ocean surface in the deeper part of the ocean. So in other words, the, the driver is the, the forcing and the feedback is the, the increased uh, outgoing uh, 
radi radiation and also another heat reservoir. Important as heat reservoir is the deep part of the ocean. So in other words, uh, so from here, you, you can kind of already see that, that the fact the ocean takes up uh, anthropogenic uh, greenhouse heat, uh, greenhouse heat, anthropogenic heat, uh, which uh, would, would, would otherwise be available to warm the, 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 the Earth's surface. Uh, so in that sense, the ocean heat uptake is slowing down the rate of global surface warming. So roughly, I, I would say like uh, uh, this effect represents about 50% uh, of the of the possible warming if uh, ocean is fully in equilibrium. So in, in other words, that the ocean take ocean heat uptake slows down the surface warming by something like fifty percent. So that that is a very important contribution, obviously. So this is a kind of a, as a global average, uh, how does the ocean do? And also, uh, you know, one remarkable uh, achievement of uh, uh, climate and ocean observations is uh, kind of illustrated by this uh, time, time series. So I guess uh, uh, the red represents the, the satellite observation of the net radiated flux at the top of atmosphere. So in addition to like year to year variability and over the past 15 years, we now uh, see there's uh, upward, upward trend uh, emerging from uh, the top atmosphere net radiation uh, into the Earth, right? And, and this uh, net radiative energy at the top atmosphere is being mostly stored in the ocean by raising the ocean temperature. And the rising ocean temperature is equivalent to a thermal expansion. So thermal expansion would be to sea level rise. So these things are all interconnected. So uh, uh, independently, Oceanographers have been observing uh, ocean temperature uh, change uh, through by using the so-called algal flows. Uh, you know, there, there are about uh, like 3,000 or maybe 5,000 such floats uh, in the ocean, uh, measuring temperature from the surface all the way to 2,000 meters. And over the same 15-year period, uh, as uh, represented by the blue curve. You kind of see this astonishing uh, agreement between uh, the blue and red curve, not only in the rising trend, and in some cases uh, in the year to year variability, uh, the, the bumps and, and troughs. So, the, in, and then over the, these, uh, these years, people have measured roughly at this very similar uh, trend uh, per decade. So, in other words, it's, it's it, it has been measured uh, the the net top atmosphere radiative uh, imbalance is about uh, 0.5 watts per square meter uh, per decade. So a doubling of CO2 is equivalent to something like a four watts per square meter. So this uh, uh, 0.5 watts per square meter per decade is a very significant significant uh, number. And what what I'm trying to communicate here is. Uh, the top atmosphere radiated flux and uh, the ocean temperature increase uh, in good agreement over the overlapping a 15 year period. So they are all independent uh, measurements, but they, they kind of uh, agree uh, pretty well uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the, as the right hand side and right hand side uh, terms. I, I think this is a quite uh, a, a feat uh, for for uh, uh, Earth observations. Uh, okay, so, so that's uh, for global mean surface temperature. So uh, here I am uh, showing a, a two-dimensional map of uh, surface temperature change uh, over by the end of this century as projected by the IPCC uh, fifth assessment report. If uh, you know, according to a uh, business as usual scenario, we call RCP 8.5. Uh, so by end of the century, uh, uh, it's a, it, you know, the models are projecting uh, warming on, on the, you know, according to this scenario, uh, 
on, on the order of uh, three to four degrees Celsius. Of course, uh, you know, there are some presence, horizontal presence in the warming. For example, land tends to warm faster than the, uh, than ocean. And, and there, there are other things you can point to. But I guess that just two first order, if you want to know a uh, warming uh, magnitude at, in Colento, the global mean surface temperature projection is a, is a pretty good approximation, uh, you know, because the, the temperature is expected warm everywhere. But I, 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 I guess, uh, you know, uh, warming in the temperature is of course important, but uh, at the same time, uh, the induced uh, rainfall change uh, you know, because the atmosphere circulation change and so on uh, are going to induce uh, a rainfall change. But I guess uh, if you are interested in rainfall, uh, precipitation change in Toronto or in San Diego, California, uh, the global mean is not going to help you very much just because the rainfall change is, uh, is uh, to first order a spatially variable. So in order to predict the local rainfall change, you must be able to predict the, the, this, this kind of pattern, large scale patterns of increase and, and patterns of decrease. So uh, for temperature, yeah, you, you don't necessarily need to worry about pattern, but for rainfall, you, you have to be able to predict the, the patterns of increase, pattern, decrease. And then naturally uh, you, 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 you might wonder so what determines the patterns of uh, rainfall change. And, and can we predict such, such a problem? So that, that is, the, and, and also what role does ocean play uh, in shaping uh, such rainfall, the, the patterns of uh, rainfall change. So uh, to illustrate that, I, I'm, here I'm showing a, a map of uh, uh, ocean surface uh, temperature change, also by by end of uh, this century. Uh, but I have a sub, in order to emphasize the spatial variations of ocean warming, uh, I have uh, subtracted the tropical mean warming, which is about three degrees Celsius. And then you can kind of see uh, there, there, you know, the ocean warming is definitely not uniform, but it is significantly variable in space. For example, uh, in the Eastern Equatorial Pacific, the warming amounts to as large, you know, the devi de deviation from the tropical mean uh, amounts to something like 0.5 degrees Celsius, whereas in the southeastern subtropical Pacific, the, the cooling is below the tropical average by something like one degree Celsius. So you, you can just sense this is a quite significant change. And now I'm, I'm going to superimpose uh, the, the rainfall change uh, projected by the same models. So, uh, so here, I, I, you know, when the regional warming is above the tropical average, I, I use the warm contour, warm color contours to, to plot. Whereas, uh, say in the in the southern hemisphere, mostly uh, the ocean warming is below the tropical average, which is represented by bluish color. So, I. I I'm going to simply post rainfall. So again, here rainfall uh, change, uh, if uh, rainfall is increasing uh, in percentage sense, uh, we, we see the region with uh, green, uh, whereas uh, for the region of decrease, we see it with uh, gray. So you kind of see there's a, a general uh, spatial correlation between the warm color contour and, and increased rainfall. And, uh, and then the blue co contours uh, tend to be uh, tend to be associated with the decreased rainfall. So this is a this is telling us actually this the unevenness of the ocean warming uh, determines largely uh, where the rainfall uh, the patterns of rainfall change in the tropics at least. This is for annual average. Uh, so so this is what we call warmer uh, get wetter pattern. Right. So the warmer is not compared to now, but compared to uh, tropical mean at any given time. So this is, uh, uh, we can explain this uh, warmer get weather pattern by invoking uh, in, the, in the tropics, uh, the atmospheric temperature uh, in the free troposphere above the atmosphere boundary 
is largely horizontally uniform. And therefore, any, uh, if you consider a convective instability, uh, if you are warming, your warming is uh, uh, above the tropical average, you tend to be uh, more unstable convectively. So that will lead to uh, increased rainfall. And vice versa, if your, your, your temperature warming is below the tropical average, you, you're going to have a reduced uh, convective instability and therefore decreased rainfall. So I guess uh, that kind of uh, illustrate, just as an uh, as example, illustrate uh, ocean warming pattern is, for, is to first order very important in determining uh, the, the spatial patterns of rainfall and presumably through uh, atmospheric saturation and so on. So uh, that is uh, kind of a, a good news, uh, in, you know, for for people like me uh, who study who study uh, ocean atmosphere interaction. So this this means uh, it's important to 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 kind of uh, study uh, the dynamics of ocean warming pattern and, and so on. So uh, that is the kind of a, a quick introduction of why ocean matters uh, in, in climate change. Uh, because uh, you know what it matters uh, uh, a lot uh, in determining the, the tropical uh, atmosphere saturation and rainfall. Okay, uh, so uh, I, I know uh, this is the physics department, so I, I'm just going to I'm going to introduce uh, maybe uh, doing a quick review of uh, a number of important things I concepts I I may I may. Uh, uh, touch upon uh, in, in the rest of my talk. So in other words, uh, you know, for the large scale flow of uh, ocean atmosphere, Coriolis force is important and Coriolis force uh, is directing to the right of uh, motion direction in the Northern hemisphere. And for the large scale flow, uh, the Coriolis force is largely in balance with the pressure gradient force, which we call a geostrophic balance, right? So the, 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 current, the, the current, large scale currents in the ocean atmosphere, uh, it is uh, largely determined by the geostrophic balance, the uh, geostrophic flow. And, and then, in the, in the case of a, a tropical cyclone, we have a low pressure at the center, so the pressure gradient force directing toward the center. Uh, so the only way you can create a Coriolis force to balance this pressure gradient force is to generate a counterclockwise uh, rotation of the wind, and so this we call the cyclonic flow, right? And also kind of in the ocean, uh, if you have a warm, warm core eddy, that means that because ocean is stably stratified, surface water is warmer uh, than the deep water. The deep water temperature is about two degrees Celsius, whereas the surface temperature in the tropics, 25, 30 degrees Celsius. So you have a, a kind of a, a, a deepening of the thermal kind that represents uh, warmer temperature than surrounding. And then uh, by thermal expansion uh, that requires uh, the ocean surface to rise a little bit uh, than the surrounding. And then the, this uh, uh, rising sea level uh, would generate uh, what we call anti-cyclonic eddy. Uh, means, uh, uh, means meaning uh, clockwise in the Northern hemisphere, uh, again, due to the Coriolis effect and, and the need for the flow to to be in geographic balance. Yeah, so, so this, this uh, kind of warm body of uh, ocean water is associated with uh, rising sea level. So we're, we're going to mention this uh, a few times in the rest of my talk. And also, uh, you know, in the presence of uh, surface winds, um, uh, at least for the surface water, uh, the wind is going to apply drag on the ocean, ocean surface water. And, and the, the way to balance the, the drag is by, uh, put, by driving uh, Ackermann surface flow uh, kind of to the right of the wind direction in the Northern Hemisphere. So the Coriolis force uh, can balance the wind drag. And this is uh, exactly the mechanism for uh, the northerly winds the winds from the north to drive uh, upwelling on the coast of California. So where, where we benefit uh, on, in San Diego and other places on the west coast of uh, North America in summer. 
Okay, uh, and then uh, last bit uh, in terms of uh, ocean circulation, uh, upper ocean circulation. So we will hear a gyre circulation. So that, that just means uh, this uh, anticyclonic circulation that's present in the subtropics of the ocean uh, due to uh, the, the vorticity or the curls of the surface wind, which uh, I, I will show uh, briefly uh, later. So this is a gyre circulation, the upper ocean circulation, uh, uh, clockwise or counter uh, anticyclonic. So in the North Pacific, North Atlantic, and also the three uh, subtropical southern oceans. And uh, so these uh, subtropical gyres are the response to uh, uneven distribution of the surface winds, and they are they are kind of a confined within a, a meridionally bounded ocean, right? So the ocean boundaries are important for those gyre circulation, just the low take around. <coughs> but there is a, a so-called Antarctic circumpolar current that is flowing largely unimpeded in the, in the upper 1,000 meter in the Southern Ocean Channel. So the narrow, narrowest place is the, in the Drake Passage, uh, where the the, the bottom uh, depth is something like 1,200 meters or something like that. So naturally, this unimpeded uh, Antarctic circumpolar current is very fast. Maybe in terms of volume of transport, it, it's uh, the strongest anywhere in the ocean. So so we are going to talk about. Uh, we are going to consider you know, how the horizontal, the anti-cyclonic uh, subtropical gyre is going to change and how the Antarctic circumpolar current is going to respond to the greenhouse warming. So these, uh, of course, uh, like, like the leading order uh, uh, ocean circulation uh, south. And then, you know, this is a kind of a, a view from the top, how the upper ocean you know, surface currents uh, are distributed. And also uh, in terms of uh, heat transport in the ocean, there's a so-called meridional overturning circulation. I'm sure everybody has heard of uh, Atlantic over meridional overturning circulation. So that, that is the same. There's an uh, interhemispheric uh, ocean circulation cell that uh, the surface branch is, uh, is part of uh, the Gulf Stream we see uh, on the west western part of North Atlantic. And then the, the, the water flows into uh, Greenland Sea, uh, and then the, the cold temperature and so on is going to uh, increase, uh, reduce the temperature freezing, and then the cold temperature is going to sink to something like two or three kilometers uh, depth. And then the, the, the deep water, Atlantic deep water is going to flow south Enter, entering the Southern Ocean and upwells in the Southern Ocean. So it, it sinks in the North Atlantic and upwells broadly in this uh, Antarctic uh, second polar current region. So this, uh, this is the Southern Ocean upwell right, in time effect. And then the, the, up, the surface water, the warm surface water is going to gradually find its way into the North Atlantic. So needless to say, the upper branch directing towards the North Atlantic is warm, whereas the deep branch that is directing toward the Southern Ocean is cold. So this overturning circulation transports a lot of heat from the Southern into the Northern Hemisphere. So this is how the ocean heat transport uh, is accomplished uh, in the world ocean you know, through uh, the Mariana overturning circulation largely. And, and, and this, uh, uh, Horizontal gyre circulation, uh, if you average uh, across the ocean basin, they, they contribute relatively little uh, to the, the global uh, uh, meridional heat transport. Uh, okay, so this is a kind of a, a really a brief uh, review of uh, relevant oceanography uh, I would like to kind of quickly go through. Okay, so next uh, I'd like to uh, talk a uh, little bit about how does ocean circulation change, right? So uh, in a in a scenario projection, say uh, in the in the current uh, couple model intercomparison project, uh, 
phase six. So that these are the so-called state of art climate models. And then you, if you kind of increase the CO2 uh, 1% per year, so that, that's a kind of a typical of uh, uh, the rate of emission uh, to the atmosphere over the past uh, half century or so. So you, you, by, by the time, uh, you, in this case, I guess uh, it, it's, it's uh, 140 years later when the CO2 reaches the four times the, the pre-industrial level. And then this is the sea surface temperature change uh, you see in the model, in, in, the, in many model average. So uh, yeah, without kind of going into detail, you just see warming everywhere. And maybe uh, in the North Atlantic, uh, there's a reduced warming. So people call it warming hole or something. And then uh, the, the surface salinity, uh, of course, global the salinity globally average is not going to change just because the, the amount of ocean water is, is constant largely. But but because uh, the warming and the atmosphere carries more water vapor, and the, the eddies uh, or the or the traveling storms uh, in the storm tracks are going to transport more moisture from the tropics into the high latitude. So that would uh, uh, increase rainfall uh, in the high latitudes, making uh, the surface salinity uh, smaller, especially in the subpolar North Atlantic. Uh, so these are the features I would like, uh, like you to kind of, uh, re re remember. But you know, in terms of wind, right? So for the ocean, if you're oceanographer, you, you would view uh, sea surface temperature, surface salinity, and then uh, the wind wind stress at the surface as uh, your boundary forcing, right? Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, especially the wind, uh, you know, the subtropical gyre and, and the Antarctic circumpolar current, these are considered to be wind-driven circulation. But when, when you turn, you know, when, when the global sea surface temperature has warmed by five to six degrees Celsius, if you look at the, the surface wind change, you will find uh, it's rather incoherent and weak, right? Except in the Southern Ocean, the westerly jet, westerly wind uh, is, known, is, is known to intensify a little bit and maybe shift southward a little bit. But the, the, maybe the, the surprise is the wind is, uh, wind change is uh, highly inconsistent and not robust across climate models. And we will, we will show actually that the wind change turns out not to be uh, important at the, at, the, at the leading order in terms of driving circulation change. So, so what else uh, by what mechanism uh, the ocean circulation is responding to uh, climate warming? So that, that is what I, I, I want to kind of uh, discuss. Uh, Next, so so uh, coming back to the subtropical gyre. So uh, this is taken from uh, some textbook. Uh, so the subtropical gyre is just uh, 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 anticyclonic or clockwise in the northern hemisphere, and it, it's a result of the the wind shear between the mid latitude westerlies and tropical easterly winds, and the wind shear is can drive this kind of a uh, anticyclonic circulation. And these lines we call string function, you can view as the constant pressure lines, right? And geostrophic wind, a geostrophic ocean current is it, going to be a geostrophic in a sense, uh, they are going to uh, flow along uh, the, the string line uh, or, or the constant pressure line. And the pressure is high, highest uh, in, uh, of the west, western boundary of the ocean in the middle of the subtropical gyre. And th this you can see, you can view as the surface, sea surface height. So the, the surface height is, uh, is highest over here. Uh, or the surface height is the surface height is higher because the, the thermal climb is deepest. The thermal climb is the, is the boundary between the warm water at the top and, and the cold water at the beneath. Right? So when you have a really a deep uh, water column, 
that that means your, your C level needs to be higher just because of thermal expansion. So anyway, so this is a subtropical gyre and, and for mass conservation, you would require uh, this uh, southward flow, the, the, the mass transport to be returned to the, to the northern mid-latitudes through what we call western boundary currents. So uh, it's always the case in the western part of the ocean, the ocean currents are most intense. Uh, for the reasons I just stated. So, uh, so let's, this is the kind of the current uh, chronological distribution like Gulf Stream or the Crow Shield uh, in, the, in the North Pacific. So next I'm going to uh, discuss how the ocean would respond to uh, surface warming, right? And, and, and to uh, surface wind change. So this is a, a particular ocean general circulation model a three-dimensional ocean general circulation model in the global domain. And then this is uh, like a, the surface height response uh, for the, 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 the DV uh, change from the current climate. And then you kind of see, uh, this is a Japan, right? So there's the crucial current. And then this is the current change in the warmer climate. So basically you see a, a intensification of the subtropical gyre uh, near the surface, right? Uh, so you, you, at least you see very coherent uh, change pattern uh, kind of to, in, to strengthen existing uh, subtropical gyre. But when you turn uh, to the experiment results, when we only apply the wind, surface wind change, then you will see like in the mid latitudes or the subtropics, the ocean current change is rather incoherent and weak. Uh, let's ignore the, the equatorial ocean, right? Equatorial ocean is a different animal we're, we're not going to discuss here. But in a subtropical gyre, I would say the response to the wind change uh, is rather weak and incoherent, right? So, so then you might wonder, so why uh, the old subtropical gyre is so responsive to the surface warming? Right, uh, rather, uh, and not so much to the wind change. Of course, the wind change itself is in incoherent and small to begin with. But the, the key point is not wind. Yeah, because I know like a, a lot of oceanographic study tends to focus on how the circulation responds to wind variations and so on. But it seems that in the in in the greenhouse warming case, at least. Uh, we should pay more attention to uh, the surface warming effect. So, so next, I'm just going to uh, using, use some cartoon to illustrate uh, how does the surface warming might lead to an intensified subtropical gyre. So uh, th this is, a, a, I'm, a lo I'm looking at the longitude depth section, right? So you cut through, uh, let's say 25 degrees and north. So, uh, West coast of North America is here, uh, this is the Asian coast. And the subtropical gyre uh, itself uh, requires uh, a, a kind of sloping uh, thermal climb, uh, warm water above and, uh, and cold water below. And, and then the, and the, the point is uh, because the thermal climb is, uh, is the boundary uh, impeding uh, surface warming to, be, to penetrate across the thermal climb. So if you apply surface warming, right? And then your, your top layer is going to warm uh, almost immediately, very quickly. But then the, the depth of your warming is determined by the mean depth of the thermal climb, which is sloping like this. So then the warming of uh, this distribution will call for a sea level change. Oh, a sea level change like this, because uh, the, the the deeper the depth of the warming, uh, the higher sea level you are going to expect. So that sea level uh, uh, pattern is uh, almost identical to the mean subtropical gyre. So that, that is why at the surface with this sea level change, you expect to see a spin up or the, or, or intensification of the subtropical gyre. But then uh, there's a problem because the, if uh, you just stop here, uh, you have a problem just because you have to, because sea level uh, variations intensified. 
So you have to, you you will leave, you will end up with large uh, Mariano uh, mass transport or the volume of transport uh, by the ocean, which is the, that that increased volume of transport is is not allowed because the 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 mass transport is uh, determined by uh, according to a relationship we call surge of transport, which is a function of wind stress, shear, median shear of the wind stress only. So here we we applied only surface warming, surface warming uh, forcing. So the, the winds have not changed, right? So in order, you have to kind of, that means that the surge of transport cannot change. So in, if you stop here, you, you have to increase surge of transport, but that, that is not allowed. So the only way you can do that is by, you, you show the, the subtropical gyre. So you make a subtropical gyre uh, top intensified, but you make the, its depths uh, shrink, get, you, you, you shallow, you make the subtropical gyre shallower. So in other words, uh, at the surface, you, you will see intensify the subtropical gyre, but in the lower, lower layer of your subtropical gyre, you will see a, a deceleration of the subtropical gyre. So this is the projection based upon the conservation of a surge of transport. So that, that will lead to the prediction of intensified surface flow and decelerated uh, lower, lower circulation of the subtropical gyre. So that is exactly uh, what we observed in the, in the ocean general circulation model. So at the top layer, we see a, a cyclonic, intensified cyclonic gyre flow, whereas uh, uh, at the lower layer, in this case, 500 to 1,000 meter, you see a reverse flow, right? Uh, the, the reversal of, uh, of the top layer acceleration is the through of uh, the surface of transport not to change because the wind is not changing. Okay, so this is a very kind of a, uh, in a sense, it's somewhat surprising, but but not surprising uh, if if uh, we, we consider surface of transport. Okay, so this is a, a showing and a surface intensified subtropical gyre, and then that you know the last uh, last slide was for. Uh, non specific uh, subtropical gyre circulation. And this is uh, 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 vector shows uh, the surface, uh, surface current uh, change, right? Change vector. And the, the red colors indicate uh, the change vectors are, 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 are intensifying uh, the current uh, ocean circulation at that depth, right? So, kind of mostly. Almost everywhere in the ocean, you see acceleration of uh, existing uh, circulation pattern. Okay, May with uh, a few exceptions. Uh, even not. Th this is uh, the. I have to clarify. This is uh, the the ocean circu circulation response to increase the sea surface temperature of something like uh, four degrees Celsius. You know, equivalent to uh, four times uh, CO two level. So when when we apply a uh, surface warming forcing to the ocean global ocean general circulation model, it leads to a global acceleration, but at, at the surface. But we know like uh, there is a global deceleration in the lower subtropical gyre, uh, at least in the lower subtropical gyre. So so in other words, in the subtropical ocean, uh, the acceleration is confined near the surface. Whereas uh, at the lower layers, we expect to see uh, a deceleration. So there's a vertical dipole, in other words, in terms of uh, circulation change. But, but I, I just thought it's quite astonishing that the surface warming can lead to uh, such global consistent pattern at the surface in terms of ocean surface circulation, just global acceleration. So this uh, result is uh, going to be published uh, in two or three weeks in science advances. So uh, we are very, very pleased uh, uh, about that. Okay, uh, so this is a, so my first uh, stop is uh, 
uh, is the subtropical gyre. So the, this elegant uh, argument by invoking a surge of transport. Uh, and, but another important region of, uh, of uh, great ocean circulating change is in the Southern Ocean. In the Southern Ocean Channel, kind of a unimpeded uh, uh, Antarctic second polar current, right? So, so you might, you, you know, subtropical gyre acceleration certainly uh, very striking, but equally striking is the acceleration of the Antarctic second polar current. So, what happens there? Right? So that, that's what I, I, I want to kind of uh, talk next. So, uh, so to, in order to understand what happens in the Southern Ocean, so this, here I'm showing a global east-west uh, averaged uh, circulate. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> yeah. Uh, picture. So this is uh, from surface to 1500 meters, uh, 70 degrees south to 30 degrees south. So the so this is uh, kind of a, in the southern general southern ocean region. In order to understand, and, and then the, the color shading uh, is the temperature increase. Again, in the in the same global uh, ocean general circulation model. So uh, you kind of see there's a large warming uh, around the latitude, 50, 45 degree latitude uh, south. So this enhanced warming here and lack of much weaker warming in the in the Southern Ocean Channel is actually due to this uh, uh, deep overturning circulation. So we have briefly talked about earlier. So sinking in North Atlantic and and, and broad general uh, upwelling in the in the Southern Ocean Channel. So in other words, uh, the because the the slow sloped uh, Upwelling uh, brings uh, water, deep water that that was uh, last in contact with the atmosphere hundreds, if not thousands, years ago. Right? Because it takes uh, a lot of time for the water to sink, sink here to kind of surface in the southern ocean. In other words, uh, you know, southern. If you are in the in the southern ocean upwelling zone, you 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 see uh, very old water. Uh, hundreds of years old water uh, coming out uh, from the deep ocean. So that, that constant upwelling of uh, old water would have suppressed the surface warming, right, of the ocean, because you are constantly supplied with delta T uh, zero water. So, so that is why uh, the surface ocean heat uptake, the surface flux, uh, when you apply uh, greenhouse warming, if forcing, uh, the atmosphere warms faster, you know, and, and atmosphere warming uh, to first order is uniform in space. But the, the Southern Ocean upwelling region is prohibited from a uh, rising, uh, from a rapid temperature rise. So that's why, uh, you know, the, the a lot of heat flux is going to the ocean in the Southern Ocean upwelling region. But uh, the the strongest warming of the ocean is displaced uh, north of this uh, Southern Ocean Channel, just because the, the winds uh, are the westerly, right? Uh, winds are westerly, and the westerly wind in the Southern Hemisphere uh, drive uh, uh, equator world economic flow. So the economic flow carries the warm water uh, equator world, and that explains the, you know, why the, the, the strongest uh, ocean warming happens not in the Southern Ocean Channel, but to the, or rather uh, on the, to, the, to the north of the Southern Ocean Channel. So that is uh, the warming over here, right? So you kind of see larger warming. And then the, the kind of a strong warming and, and with a great penetrating depths in a, just north of the Southern Ocean, Southern Ocean Channel, uh, Calls for a, a larger a thermal expansion, right? So the sea level has to rise a little bit here, and then that corresponds to uh, the, the geostructural flow that is to accelerate uh, the Antarctic circumpolar current. And, and also note, uh, 
so that that the delta velocity, the u velocity, is the the eastward acceleration is uh, is highlighted with the the black contours here. So so as you can see here, uh, in contrast to the purple gyre, you have an acceleration surface and, and, and deceleration in the lower layer. But in the southern ocean, uh, in contrast, the ocean accelerate, current acceleration is of a very deep vertical structure because this is a kind of barotonic, right? So it's supported by the horizontal temperature gradient. Okay, so th this is a lot to explain, but you know, to step back, this is an inevitable consequence of uh, the broad upwelling of uh, old water in the Southern Ocean Channel. And, and also this acceleration is the result of the ocean, the, the, the main generally uh, differential uh, ocean warming pattern. Uh, to uh, this is uh, the current relationship. Okay, so that all sounds great. And, and then without going into a lot of details, I'm just, uh, I'm glad to, to actually, to, to show actually uh, the model simulation uh, is now backed up by ocean observations, uh, both uh, in, the, in, the, in the kind of a, the top, a uh, one kilometer, a uh, two kilometer ocean uh, temperature profiles. So, so with this algo floats, people have been observing uh, ocean temperature change over the past uh, 15 years. So indeed, so, so there's a 50 degrees south. And then the, the black contours here uh, show that the current, the mean current, eastward current, Antarctic circumpolar current. So the, the, the core of the, the, the Antarctic circumpolar current is over here, and the strongest warming is indeed uh, displaced uh, north of this uh, Antarctic circumpolar current. And if you use the geographic wind calculation, uh, you can easily show that you know here the contours, the line contours are again the mean current, whereas uh, the shading here uh, represents the the eastward current change. Right, so you can just see this. Uh, very deep penetrating uh, acceleration of uh, Antarctic circumpolar current in the Southern Ocean. So there's a, in the Southern Ocean uh, current acceleration is a, is a very deep reaching a vertical structure. And th this uh, observational paper was just published uh, late last year in Nature Climate Change in case you are interested. Okay, uh, so I'm uh, approaching uh, the time. So I, I'm uh, just going to quickly uh, wrap up. Uh, maybe yeah. So so I, I'm just going to show the uh, the surface heat flux, right? So we have uh, talked about why in the southern ocean we expect to see a lot of anthropogenic heat going to the the ocean at in the, over the southern ocean, but in the North Atlantic we also see there's a, a lot a red a, a hot spot where the anthropogenic heat is being uh, flux into ocean. But in much of uh, most of ocean, uh, vast uh, world ocean actually, the, the ocean atmosphere uh, is not fluxing any exchange heat uh, that much, just because uh, you know this is a sinking branch of the global medium of Chinese circulation. And the Southern Ocean is up by the right? So indeed, it is, it is the overturning circulation, uh, in terms of overturning circulation, that is determining where uh, the anthropogenic heat is being taken up by the ocean, either in the Southern Ocean or in the, in the, in the North Atlantic. So uh, this uh, heat, heat flux, uh, distribution uh, male young uh, turns out to be very important in driving uh, the tropical atmospheric circulation and rainfall pattern. So I'm just uh, going to use a very quick example. I skipped uh, a couple of slides, but I, this is the last slide I, I want to show. In other words, uh, you know, in the Northern Hemisphere, historically, uh, human activities have emitted a lot of uh, sunlight reflecting aerosols. 
So basically, in the northern hemisphere, we have a polluted atmosphere. So the the some of the solar radiation has been reflected back to to space. So this represents a loss of of energy from the top of atmosphere. So the loss of energy in the southern hemisphere needs to be compensated by uh, the heat transport from the southern into northern hemisphere, either through atmosphere or, or, or through the ocean. So if we say the ocean is not moving, then atmosphere has to transport all the energy uh, from southern into northern hemisphere. That will call for such overturning circulation in atmosphere with uh, the tropical rainfall, uh, rain band displaced to the south. So that, that, that's assuming ocean is not doing any, 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 any transport. But in reality, ocean circulation also transport heat. So that will lead to uh, the overturning circulation change. Overturning circulation helps transport energy uh, to compensate the loss of energy due to aerosol. And that will lead to a weaker atmosphere transport or circulation. So this, this is a complicated uh, interaction uh, between interhemispheric uh, ocean atmosphere circulation uh, in order to balance not only uh, the, the planetary energy budget, but also the hemispheric energy budget. So that will call for interhemispheric ocean atmosphere overturning circulation change without you know, explaining uh, too much in detail. Okay, so so I skip. Uh, yeah, so just to to sum up, so we have identified actually the surface warming, especially uh, surface warming effect uh, due to sense and straf density straf stratification, seem to dominate over the wind effect uh, in response to a greenhouse warming uh, due to the radiant forcing. And in the subtropical region, we expect to see intensified surface currents was uh, a, a shoaling of the subtropical gyre, whereas the, in the Southern Ocean, the accelerated Antarctic circumpolar current is of a very deep vertical structure. And we, yeah, this I didn't show, but in Atlantic Meridian overturning circulation, it's, it's projected to slow down in response to greenhouse warming and due to a number of reasons, which are also skipped. <laughs> uh, but as uh, just an important uh, final comment, I would emphasize ocean heat uptake is important for both the global mean surface temperature because ocean store the heat in the deep ocean, which would otherwise be used to warm the surface the temperature even more. But also in terms of the second order, in terms of interhemispheric uh, overturning circulation of the atmosphere, highly circulation, monsoon, and so on. So that will call for uh, renewed uh, interest or research into the dynamics of ocean warming pattern as well as the ocean transport or heat uptake that that's uh, especially heat transport in the ocean is largely accomplished by overturning circulation of deep and shallow types so that that is a, a little kind of a, a projection or, or the direction i i would like to uh, explore and hopefully as some of uh, uh, others in the in the audience would also uh, be joining us okay thank you